The Florida Everglades. Beautiful. Vast. Harsh. Remote. It is a huge wetland that flows across most of southern Florida and then it runs into the ocean. Some of North America's fiercest predators live here, including the American alligator and the bull shark. They're top predators. They eat a lot of different types of prey, which means they could have a big impact on a lot of different types of prey populations, which then could have cascading effects down to lower levels in the food chain. Despite its wild nature, the Everglades is an ecosystem in trouble. For nearly a century, man drained the swamp. Now, a large-scale restoration project aims to return the wetland to its former glory. More and more fresh water is gonna come in, so it's really important we get the water right, and we know how animals like sharks and alligators respond, so we're managing the ecosystem right for them. That's why we're doing these studies, to get an idea and make predictions about how this change will affect the ecosystem. So we can protect those animals and make sure they fill that critical ecological role. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving. On the southern tip of the Florida Peninsula, the Everglades meet the Gulf of Mexico. Here, the river of grass gives way to a maze of mangrove-lined rivers that eventually flow into the sea. The Shark River estuary is the terminus of the Shark River Slough, which is a major part of the central and southern Everglades that is the main conduit of freshwater out of the Everglades and into the Gulf of Mexico. So the Shark River is a really important place where freshwater from the north and uh, saltwater from the Gulf of Mexico mix together, and we get this really interesting mix of organisms. Recognized as a wetland of international importance, the Everglades ecosystem is a unique place. There's a huge abundance of life here. It's one of those wilderness places that are few and far between on the planet now, but it's also a place that's affected a lot by humans. Over the course of the 20th century, humans have greatly changed the way water flows across the Everglades. Canals and dikes were built to provide flood control and deliver fresh water to agricultural operations and South Florida's ever-growing human population. This greatly decreased the amount of fresh water flowing across the Everglades. That fresh water that's the source of life for this part of the Everglades, the tap's kind of been turned off. The impacts on the natural system were severe. And now, a multi-billion dollar restoration project is underway to return some of that water back to the Everglades. As we re-engineer the water, we need to figure out how the plants and animals are going to respond so we don't muck up the ecosystem even worse. So really understanding how important different species are, how they respond to the water and other conditions is critical for getting the restoration right. To better understand the various ecological role species play in the coastal Everglades, Mike Heithouse and his team study predator-prey interactions and how predators respond to changes in the environment. So a lot of the work we do is trying to figure out how humans affect this ecosystem, and as we try to restore it, how that's going to affect the big predators like alligators and sharks. To do so, scientists want to know where the animals are found and why. 
During the daytime, they try to catch bull sharks in different parts of the Shark River. We have four different areas within the estuary that we set lines that typically have different conditions, mainly differences in salinity. And so we set the lines at a salinity gradient starting from the ocean all the way up to the freshwater marshes and in between. Using the number of sharks caught in different locations and at different times of the year, the scientist can determine the types of areas and conditions the animals need. When we first came out here, we were told there's no way you're going to find sharks. We set our first lines and had two sharks on our very first one. Bull sharks are the only species of shark in North America that can live in fresh water. And the juvenile sharks usually live in rivers and estuaries until they're big enough to move to the ocean. To catch bull sharks, we use long lines with baited hooks with mullet and those sit on the bottom for about an hour. So the long lines have about 50 hooks and we allow them to soak to attract any sharks that are in the area. And we also use drum lines, which have larger hooks and larger bait to catch large predatory sharks that may feed on the juvenile bull sharks to quantify the risk of predation that they have in different areas. Little shark. Yeah. Oh, this is a little, little guy. After we catch a shark, we take length measurements. 55, 62 and a half, and 78. Weight measurements. Four kilograms. We put an external identification tag in them so that if we recapture them, we can determine how much they've grown and if their body mass has changed. Identification tag J10641. That's the umbilical scar, and it takes a couple months for that to heal. So when we see that, we know that this shark is relatively newborn, definitely less than one year old. The scientists are also interested in studying the diets of the sharks using a method called stable isotope analysis. It's based on the idea that you are what you eat. And so carbon and nitrogen are common elements in our bodies. And we can look at different forms of those carbon and nitrogen isotopes and look at their ratios. And so what happens is that plants have different values for their carbon, whether they're plants in the ocean or plants in fresh water. When animals eat plants or other animals, these carbon values stay roughly the same. So by analyzing the carbon isotopes in a shark, scientists can tell whether it is fed in food webs from the ocean or from fresh water. The nitrogen isotopes in its body show how high in the food chain the animal eats. Different tissues in the animal's body reflect what and where an animal has eaten over various time periods. Fin tissue turns over the slowest, and it takes about a year and a half to two years for that tissue to be replaced. So it's a very long-term estimate of their diet. The muscle tissue takes about a year and a half to be replaced, so that's another long-term tissue that we use to look at their diet. And then blood, we look at whole blood, which is just the blood extracted from their veins, and that turns over in about a year. So that's kind of a mid-range estimate of their diet. And then we actually separate the blood and we extract the plasma, which is replaced relatively quickly, and that provides us with a short-term estimate of their diet, and that actually allows us to look at seasonal changes or actually changes in their diet based on size. We have caught sharks all the way up at the top of the river, about 20 miles from the ocean. So there's sharks everywhere within the estuary. When they're born, they're typically eating only estuarine and freshwater fish and other species. And then as they grow, they're starting to eat more animals from marine food webs. To expand their data, the scientists also outfit the juvenile sharks with acoustic transmitters. <laughs> So the long lining allows us to determine which areas have more sharks in them. However, it doesn't give us a fine scale estimate of what the sharks are doing in between the time when we set these lines. And so we acoustically tag them and passively monitor their movement so we can know what they're doing 
while they're in the estuary until they leave. Come here, little cutie. There we go. For a lot of shark species, when they're turned on their backs, they go into a more relaxed state. This allows us to do the surgeries to insert the acoustic transmitters into them without the sharks thrashing around too much. The transmitters emit unique frequency that's recorded by the receivers when they're within their listening range, and the battery life is up to three years. So these acoustic transmitters, they send out an ultrasonic ping randomly every 60 to 120 seconds, and the ping is a unique code. And then those pings are heard by monitors that we have stationed throughout the Everglades, and those monitors have ranges of up to 1,000 meters. The monitor will record the date and the time and the individual that was there. And they're arranged in a pattern such that they're paired so we can determine not only the location of the sharks, but the direction that they're moving. Since 2006, the scientists have caught nearly 300 sharks and have acoustically tagged more than 60. This project is ongoing and a long-term project and we're interested in how the change in abundance varies annually and try to correlate that with changes in things like temperature, rainfall, and the dynamics of the seasons. So we pulled up our monitor over here from the water and it has picked up more than 12,000 detections, so that's really good. Over time, the research has revealed some astonishing information. The juvenile bull sharks live away from the ocean to be safe from larger sharks that could eat them. Some individuals, however, are willing to take risks for a meal. They might go from these freshwater areas down to the ocean and back again. There might be more food down at the ocean, but you have to run the gauntlet of big sharks to get there. So a lot of individuals are not willing to risk getting eaten by a bigger shark to go grab a meal. Others, for some reason, are. We're trying to find out why. If you don't understand the patterns of specialization within individuals, you can't develop particularly effective conservation and management plans. Another top predator at home in the Everglades is the alligator. Its behaviors could also provide clues to the scientists on how changes in freshwater levels might impact the ecosystem. Currently, freshwater levels in the Everglades can vary widely between seasons and from year to year, creating a natural experiment that helps experts make predictions about the future. We're trying to figure out how they're behaving now under the current water management system to predict how those behaviors are going to change in the future and then predict how the Everglades as a whole might change in the future in response to that as well. As with sharks, the experts want to know where the alligators go and what they eat. But to track the animal's movement, scientists first need to catch the large reptiles. Tell me when we're on top of them. Okay, slow, 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 slow. We go out at night because it's easier to find them at night. And we use spotlights to find their eye shine because their eye lights up really bright red. Gator, straight ahead. I see it. Oh, it went under. Persistence and patience. Okay, got one here. And there's another one up there too. Got two of them right here. And then we approach them. We have these long poles with snares around the end of them so we can slip it around their neck and snare them. So what do you say? Biggest we've caught by a good few pounds? We have an easier time catching the alligators the bigger they are because they are less wary. They're used to being king of the hill. Whereas the smaller alligators are a little bit more jumpy. Alligators are cannibals, so the, the smaller juvenile alligators, they need to be scared of bigger things. Whereas those big alligators, they've been, you know, large for so long, they don't care. Oh, 
Before the alligator is brought on board... Yeah, you don't like me at all. Hiss, hiss, hiss. Its mouth is taped shut as a precaution. That's enough. Yep, it's good. While an alligator can chomp down fiercely on its prey, the muscles that open its mouth are rather weak. So you can actually hold an alligator's mouth yeah. shut just with one finger just pressing down, and they don't have the power to open it. It's the closing power you've got to be afraid of. To study their diet, scientists take blood and skin samples for stable isotope analysis. So we take the skin sample from what's called the scoots. It's kind of the ridges that you see as you look at an alligator's back. So I clip a small piece of the scoot off of the back of the tail. And we do that because that's the easiest place to get a skin sample. And it also doesn't hurt them because they don't have any nerve endings in the tops of those scoots. So it doesn't bother them. Lift, 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 lift. Next, a gator is weighed and measured. And an external tag is attached to its toe. It's a little metal tag that has a five-digit number in it. And so if anybody anywhere in the state catches that alligator again, they can, you know, say, okay, where was it originally tagged? And we can learn about their movements and behaviors in that way also. To track the alligator's movements within the estuary, they too are outfitted with acoustic transmitters. What I do is I attach it to the external part of the tail. So I drill holes in the scoots. And again, they don't have any nerve endings in that part of their body, so it doesn't hurt them. Then we thread some stainless steel wire through the scoots and also through the transmitter. The wire keeps the transmitter in place on the tail, and then we cover it with a marine-grade epoxy that'll set underwater. And the other half? And so it'll keep that whole thing in place and also streamline the attachment. Okay, that's looking good. For my study, I only track adults, and adults in the Everglades are considered uh, basically six feet or bigger. The average size of the animals we catch is between six and eight feet. The biggest we've ever caught is nine feet. In other parts of the alligator's range, they will grow bigger. They'll grow to 12, 13, 14 feet, and that's because they have much better food to eat, and so it enables them to grow faster and bigger. One of the first alligators I ever tagged, I'm still getting data from today. So I've been tracking this alligator for four and a half years, roughly. Right here. Right here. Left, left, left. We've caught over 100 alligators. We've attached tracking devices to 52 of them. I got him. I got him. I got him. Oh, I got him. In addition to taking blood and skin samples, Adam has also analyzed the stomach contents of about 50 alligators to learn more about their diet. So right now we are immobilizing his arms and legs so that we can transport him without fear of him climbing out of the boat. The duct tape that we're putting on them protects them from hurting themselves and us. One, two, Taking the stomach contents from an alligator is similar to a person having his or her stomach pumped at the hospital. It is the least invasive method for scientists to collect this critical information. So that's one of my favorite parts. We strap it to a long wooden plank with duct tape and with straps to make sure that it can't move too much because it's really not for our safety, it's for its own safety because if it moves during this process, it could hurt itself. So we strap it to the board and then we angle the board so that the head is pointing down. And then we take the tape off of the mouth and it instinctually opens its mouth up. Oh, hello. And then we take a PVC pipe and we place it in the mouth. Woo! Oh. <laughs> Hello, sir. The pipe is strong enough that it doesn't break in the alligator's mouth. So the pipe is basically holding the alligator's mouth open. And then we tape the mouth around the PVC so that it can't also open its mouth anymore. We take a hose that's been coated in mineral oil, and I stick the hose through the PVC pipe that's in the mouth and down through the esophagus and into the stomach. Ooh, a little bit. Ooh that smells lovely. Whoa, there we go, that's disgusting. And then once it's in the stomach, I turn on a pump that fills the stomach with water. And then we do sort of a gentle Heimlich maneuver motion to massage the water and the food out of the stomach and out of the mouth and into a waiting bucket. Definitely feathers. More? Yep, keep going. Oh. Yeah, 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 I feel some chunks. I feel some chunks. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, that smells so bad. Oh, my God. Oh, that's really bad. Well, we don't have a vegetarian alligator here. Oh, it's coming out in gangbusters now. Here we go. Oh, yeah, look at that. Oh, there's feathers all up in there. 
That is awesome. Wow. We find really exciting things. The most frequent thing we find is blue crab parts. We've also found crayfish. We found shrimp. Lots of tiny little fish, which was surprising. I was expecting to find them eating big fish, like, you know, a gar or a snook or something of that nature. We've also found turtle parts, other alligators. And one of the most interesting things we found was pond apple seeds. So they're these fruits called pond apples. And most people don't think that alligators would ever eat a fruit. They think that they're strict carnivores. In some alligators, we found up to four or five pond apples. And so that was a very exciting find. These big reptiles with huge mouths and big teeth. The fact that you find little fish, pond apples, and crabs came as a very big surprise for us. It's hard to say exactly why they're doing it. One thing is it's probably what's easy to catch. You might be really big, but it's hard to catch a gar or a snook or a big fish, but it's a lot easier to catch small fish. Pond apples don't run away very well, and the crabs are pretty abundant here uh, and are also easy to catch. Yep. Maybe a yummy raccoon. Maybe a yummy raccoon. That's, that's what my money's on. But we also know that when they get a chance, they will go after big things. So you find mammals and birds in them, just not as many as we thought. Ready? I'm going to drop mine first. One, two, three. But the thing about the alligators is that they have very limited food sources here. It's a very nutrient poor environment. There's the tape. Most estuaries are just teeming with life because the nutrients from the freshwater hit the nutrients from the ocean and things go crazy. But here as that fresh water moves slowly through the Everglades, most of the nutrients get sucked out. There's just not a lot of food for them. The scientists weren't just surprised by what the gators were eating, but where some of them went to feed. They travel between the freshwater and the saltwater environments. Some individuals will do it very frequently. These alligators would make upwards of a 30 kilometer round trip. So they would travel 15 kilometers from freshwater to saltwater, and they would stay in the saltwater for about a day or so, and then they would turn around and come back after a day. So they would be making these round trips every three or four days, and they would do it repeatedly. In one wet season, which lasts about six months, there was one alligator that made about 50 trips. When Adam tracked that first alligator down to the ocean, we had some people say our, our equipment must be malfunctioning. But by studying these animals with different technologies and across many years, Adam's found that probably a third of those alligators are commuters. This was a very unusual discovery. Alligators are thought to be strictly freshwater species and that they can't survive in saltwater for very long periods of time. And we have found that similar thing, but we found that they will choose to go into salt water. And that was a very interesting finding. So why would they choose to go into a salty environment? And we think that the answer is that there must be more food there. So they're trading off food for a little bit of stress, but then they come back into freshwater to sort of even out their salt load again. If it drinks the freshwater, then it can expel the extra salt from its body. The stable isotope analysis of their tissues showed that the alligators that were traveling down to the saltwater were traveling there to feed. The individuals who did not move down to the saltwater, they had isotope values indicative of a freshwater food web. Now, scientists are trying to determine if the sharks and alligators which feed in the ocean are excreting those nutrients upriver. In a system like this, where you have generally low nutrients, a little bit of nutrient coming in can have a big impact. The question for us now is, is it enough nutrient coming upstream from alligators and sharks to have a big impact? And you know that's a tough question to answer, but it's one we're trying to work on. During their research, Mike, Adam, and Phil have made some really surprising observations. One of the neatest is that we find out that these predators are really individuals. You can't just see an alligator and say, oh, it's an alligator, it does what all the other alligators do. They kind of have their own behaviors, or almost personalities. This is one of the things that's really exciting to me, is learning more of this, why are animals doing what they do, and then how does that affect their role in the ecosystem? So it's really important that we learn more about the behaviors individuals display to really understand their ecological role. So here in the Everglades, some of these more stay-at-home animals probably have a very different role in the ecosystem than the ones that commute down to the ocean. Figuring out how to properly redirect the freshwater back into the Everglades is not an easy task. 
If we put the water in in too big of a burst, we might see animals get pushed out of the system to areas where they don't survive very well. So we have to be sure that we're mimicking the natural pulses of fresh water. One thing about the Everglades is that things are changing almost constantly. We have wet seasons, we have dry seasons. So the amount of fresh water coming in varies that way. But we have wet, wet seasons, we have dry, dry seasons, we have wet, dry seasons. So by looking across many years and many seasons, we can get an idea of how fresh water affects sharks and alligators. So it requires long-term studies to really figure it out. And that's one of the exciting things about this project is we've been at it long enough that we're starting to get an idea of how these animals respond to changes in their environment. The challenge for managers isn't just getting the water right for alligators and sharks, it's for all the other organisms here as well. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving.